Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our next our mem uh, member meetup Fridays. Uh, it's so good to see everyone and virtually interact with the, with you. Uh, but today we are excited to have Pam Horsley joining us today to share a little bit about about herself and her background. Uh, you know how she got to the museum. So with that, Pam, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate you taking time to chat with our members um, and interact with them a little bit in this virtual setting. So I know it's still COVID time and pandemic time, but we are really excited to have you here, Pam. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Although I can't see anyone, so it's super weird. <laughs> that, that, that's what makes it even more exciting is that you can't see anyone. So you have to, you know, just throw out your excitement and let your excitement, um, you know, reverberate through your through your voice. Because uh, I know that's something that, uh, that, that we've, we've seen uh, a lot of is, when our members really hear from, from our scientists, from our researchers, from our staff, uh, you name it, anyone from the museum, uh, when they talk about their passion for what they do, that it, 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 it's, it's rings volume uh, to, to why, why is it that, that we're here. So with that, we wanna jump right in, Pam, and, and I know you have a really uh, unique story to how you got to where you're at, to your position at the museum and the story behind you know, Pam of getting to where uh, your role today, because I know yours is you started with the museum, but then you you left and now you're back. So can you share a little bit about that, Pam? Absolutely. So yeah, my background is in entomology. I have a master's in entomology. Um, and after, during my undergrad, I actually did an internship at the Canadian Museum of Nature. So I'm Canadian and that's where I got started. And um, during my last year of my undergrad, I did an honors thesis on taxon taxonomy of little snow beetles, little weevils. So um, that was my first exposure to collections. And I, up until that point, I had no idea collections existed at all. Um, I had obviously been to museums and exhibits, but again, this was not communicated back then, you know, that all but behind the exhibits, there was all these massive collections. So that was my first experience. And it was like a kid in a candy store. You know, I had no idea <laughs> and I was just blown away by it. So that was a sort of a pivotal moment for me. Um, and uh, the guy I was working with, his name is Robert Anderson, Bob Anderson. He's a world expert in weevil systematics and he kind of just took me under his wing. So I worked at the museum for a number of years and completed my master's with him. And after, um, right after I finished my master's, the opportunity came up for me to uh, come down here. I, I applied for a job, two-year position, NSF funded to work in the collections here and uh, actually got it. And that was the start of um, my story at the museum here. So um, sadly, the money ran out and uh, I had to leave. So I actually went back to Canada and worked at the museum in Ottawa again for a little while. And I kept applying to jobs and that led me to um, New York City. And I worked at the American Museum of Natural History. And I took a switch at that time and actually wasn't studying insects and was actually working on scorpions. Ooh. So uh, a little still, bit of a switch. And some people still a creepy crawly. So <laughs> still a creepy crawly for sure. Um, but that was, and I also um, helped curate the, the marine invertebrate collection. So that was like way different for me. Like I don't, I don't, and I don't really do that still. But, um, but my time at the American Museum was pretty amazing because I got to travel a fair amount and, uh, the the person I was working for was a world expert on scorpions and he traveled the world all the time so I got to join in some field work with him and got to go to Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka and um, that was pretty darn exciting um, but I then left that position because um, my husband now um, was actually living in Michigan and doing his PhD and he's a paleontologist so I wanted to be closer to him thought that would be nice. And so I actually um, applied for some positions in Michigan and ended up working at the University of Michigan and Michigan State University, which is bad, bad, bad. They're competitors. Ooh, yeah. you, you, so, you oh. <laughs> I did. I did. So I actually started at Michigan State working on the insect collection there. And then 
um, a job popped up at the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology and Herbarium for a registrar position. So again, it was kind of a shift for me then away from insects still a little bit yeah. um, and dealing with um, the museum as a whole and their collections management and registration and how, um, how the museum functions on a higher level. So, and then he finished his PhD and got a job back here in California and we moved back here and then uh, this job magically popped up and it was the stars were aligning and it was my dream since leaving um, back in 2012 to always come back here because of the experience I had here. So I'm super happy to be back. <laughs> Yeah, no, and I think I when I joined the museum, because I joined in 2019, and I, I was hearing uh, these like chatters of Pam is is coming back. And I was like, Oh, okay, Who, who's this Pam and, and everyone was excited to see that the stars did align and you were coming back to the museum. So Pam, I know everyone in our in our BRCC and within the museum uh, were excited to see that that you were that you were coming back to the net uh, so the stars aligned perfectly for both parties you know it was, uh. <laughs> it was a dream I think and it, it and it came and it, it came it became a reality so thank you so awesome. much for sharing your story mm -hmm. um, and so and you, you brought up different roles and you and you brought up these different opportunities that you had um, it, when, when you're going around and talking about our collection and or whether mm -hmm. when you're working within our collection you know when we loan out any specimens like what kind of projects are we currently working where we have collections out or being used or what do what are what is a collection that is being used for and how has maybe covid impacted that research right. or <laughs> the work itself because it's hard to to talk any, about anything these days without you know talking about how the covid has restricted certain things but maybe some silver linings have come out of it absolutely so yeah, well, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were shut down, obviously. So any loans or transactions that were happening or collections work in general was was very difficult to do. Um, but during that time, it actually gave me the opportunity because I had just started four days before we shut down. Oh, and it gave me the opportunity to kind of get back up to speed and, uh, you know, figure out what's happening here at the museum again. Um, and it, it gave me an opportunity to sort of clean some things up and do some some you know housekeeping I guess activities and um, we deal with a lot of digitization activities here right now that is the hot thing to do so I was cleaning a lot of data basically so we try to get our data online so it's accessible to researchers and the public and so I could clean that up and I've heard from some of our database administrators um, offsite that, you know, our data is so clean and it makes me feel really good. Way to go, Pam. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's like, oh, you really care about your data. I was like, yes, I do very much. Um, so, but since reopening, I've actually been able to be back in at the museum fairly regularly, um, which is, that makes me very happy. Um, and because I'm behind the scenes, you know, a lot of collection activities have been, have still been able to happen. Um, we have a huge volunteer program, as many people know. And so a lot of my time has been coordinating volunteer activities. And some people have worked sort of offsite at their home and can, been able to continue doing their volunteer activities with us. Um, so our projects have actually been able to move forward. So the two major projects we have going right now are the Baja Dunes project, which is Michael Wall's baby. And it's, uh, sorry, the radio's going off next to me. Um, so he's studying the insect diversity um, in, in the Baja California dunes and using that data to help um, drive conservation in the area, because obviously the dunes are a hot area and a lot of development happens in these areas. So if we can help inform um, the Mexican government of what diversity is there and you know what what the impact might be in building, um, we hope to help um, you know save some some of these areas. And then the other project that I'm more heavily involved in is called LEPNET and it's digitizing our lepidoptera, which are butterflies and moths. So we have a huge collection of butterflies and moths here at the museum. It's actually uh, it's it's 
over half of our collection is butterflies and moths. So we have strengths in Lepidoptera and Coleoptera, which are beetles. So um, my background is beetles, um, but I am now learning lots about <laughs> the butterflies and moths. And so um, we have a goal to digitize 150,000 specimens of butterflies and moths. Um, and that's concentrating on the sort of San Diego, Southern California area and Baja California. And we wrote a grant to do that. So we have um, a project assistant and some undergraduate student technicians working on this and they photograph tons and tons of specimens and get that data online. And um, we tried to justify it, I guess, because there was a huge data gap in Baja California um, and Southern California. Somehow the collections across the United States just uh, we're, we're, don't have specimens from there. So we're really, really filling that, that gap with all of our specimens. And to date, uh, even during COVID times, we've been making progress and pretty good progress in my opinion. So we're supposed to get to 150,000 specimens and we're um, approaching 60,000 at this point. So we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. exciting. I, I know it's something that a lot of times uh, it, it's, it, it's not, members get to see or hear about these these stories and about these projects that are happening in our research department because uh it, it's it's oftentimes it's work you know it's digitization it's working with data uh it's not something that's an exhibition type piece uh that that, that we could share up so i know that's always something fun and exciting when we get to be, have an opportunity to share with our members about fun projects that are happening and continue to happen even though there may be um, restrictions you know due to the pandemic but on the topic of collections is there, do you have, since you are, I, I see that you maybe are in your collection right now. I am in do the collection. Do you have like a go-to specimen or a story? Like say someone was to, to ask for a behind the scenes tour of you know, the collection that, that, that you work with, is there something that you're like, okay, I cannot let you leave without sharing this one thing or this cool story about this specimen. Is there, does that exist? Yeah terrible because I don't really have like a go-to specimen, but I would definitely uh, steer people towards beetles. <laughs> so yeah. I tend to show off um, part of the beetle collection. We have a really good scarab beetle collection. And then I would also show them levels because that's my background. But um, we have a lot of really cool specimens and we have some drawers pulled together that highlight, you know, San Diego County diversity and world diversity, some of the most beautiful specimens. So I tend to bring them to see that. But the other really cool specimen we have, and I can't, I don't know the background of this and someone else might know more about it actually, yeah. is that we have a specimen collected by Darwin in our collection. And it's a little um, brown lace wing and it's a very um, unassuming and kind of quite boring looking, but you see a little handwritten Darwin label under under it. And so I think that's a really cool one to show to people. Nice. And has there been times where when you show that, that people are just like, wait, that exists or that that happened or that we have that here at the museum? Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and they then asked like, how did we get that? And I have yeah. no idea, <laughs> but we're going to keep it and we're going to take it. So yeah, uh, yeah, and and you know, being you know, making sure that we conserve it and and we and we keep it around and we have it for the the length of of its existence here w w with us. Um, Absolutely. It, and you, when you mentioned Darwin, I know there's a lot of times when we when we have our researchers or scientists uh, joining us for these member meetups, we like to ask them. Was you brought up uh, kind of the starting point in Canada and understanding that their collections exist in museums and that was like the like the starting point for for your career was there a moment that you had in your life whether before that or even maybe it would have been at that point when you when it, the light bulb went off and you said oh the, the the conservation you know behind you know why we do what we do and you said oh this is what i want to dedicate my life to i mean the weevils or the beetles was it seeing them or interacting with them that kind of triggered that like why you wanted to do what you do so um, I think it's funny because I did not grow up as an outdoorsy person. My family is not like this in any way. We never went camping. We never did anything like this. So um, I'm like a black sheep in my family for sure that uh, 
uh, now I go camping and I'm outside and I'm hiking and doing outdoor stuff all the time. So, um, but it really was that, that, you know, being exposed to collections and, and I guess, you know, you guys, uh, while I started off in research, I really then realized that uh, I appreciate research and I believe in it entirely, but I'm much more collections management oriented and it's like Marie Kondoing the collection and using my anal retentiveness and whatnot is really what I enjoy doing. So, um, and I like it because you can dabble in research, but the majority of my job is, you know, organizing the collection, making sure that it's accessible, making sure that it's available to researchers. And so I think that's what I discovered during this process that that was more the the pivotal moment for me it was like oh maybe I don't want to do research full-time but be able to have that accessible to me but through collections management nice yeah so. I could I could see that being a I mean the, the reason why collections exist and you know they look the way they do is you, it's someone that's taking the time to painstakingly you know make sure that things are organized and labeled and kept up to date and are, there's a record of it because there you know we may not have know how we got that darwin piece but you know we can preserve it and make sure that that, that we conserve it so i i feel like that's a very important role of what you're doing for our collections and managing it um is there a wish list that you have for entomology department i know that there, there might be something you're like oh i can't wait for our entomology department to discover or find or rediscover that some one thing is there something that 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 you have in your mind that you're like i i really wish that this can come true within my time that i'm at the mat i think um it's in line with our dunes project because so much is unknown randomly it's unknown in baja california so we discover new things all the time down there so um I think I'm looking forward to discovering some new um, weevil species, actually, because there are some that live in dunes and they're not very well known. So that's my wish list. And I hope to get down there soon and do some leaf litter and sand sifting because that's what I've done. So <laughs> I'm not and they're really rare. I'm seeing the dune samples and like I'm not seeing very many the, a good diversity yet. So I want to hit like different pockets that Michael is maybe not getting to. <laughs> To yeah, find you, some more. you may have like that eye that you're like, well, you know, maybe want to find that one spot. So is there something that you look for when you when maybe you are looking out and doing research that you something that that stands out there like, oh, I think this would be a good area to search for weevils. Is there something that happens within the, within the environment that that almost signals you to say, yes, that would be a good site to to search or discover? Definitely. And the, it's not really, I'm not discovering anything new, really. It's, you want to look for plants, right? So in the dunes, it's sand, sand, sand. But if you find those little pockets of plants, that's where you really want to concentrate a lot on because you're going to get, that's where you're going to have the highest diversity of insects is the great variety of plants. And so sampling under them and what, like for my master's project, I did a ton of leaf litter sampling in, in cloud forests and rainforests. And so when all the, the trees drop their leaves and it falls to the ground, the diversity of insects, maybe people don't wanna know, but the insects that live in the leaf litter under the tree is astounding. And so, and it's a passive collecting technique. So I would just, you know, get the leaf litter into the, into the sifter. I should have had that to show everyone what that looks like. Um, but it has mesh on top and you just okay. kind of shake it and then it falls to the bottom and you get this pocket of like soil basically and then you put it into another um, machine or uh, contraption mm -hmm. and it's called a burlazy funnel you spread out the soil on top and you put a light on top and it heats up that soil and um, the insects that are living in there want to get away from the heat, right? They want to, they're living in a moist environment. So they want to get away from that and they walk down and they fall into this tunnel <laughs> and, the, and it funnels them down into a, like a little collecting jar at the bottom. And so then you get that collecting jar and you bring it back to the lab and you pour it into a little, uh, petri dish and you get to look at it under the microscope and that's when you get to see everything and that whole process is like 
the most fun thing that could happen. I, feel. I can I could see it. I can see it just when you're describing it. You can see the excitement that yeah. comes out of of getting to that point when you have the, the little jar of, of what of did stuff. I get? What did I get? <laughs> but you don't so know exciting. until you go back to the lab and you look under the microscope. Exactly. So, and that's a, we do a lot of t sampling like that in the dunes right now. And we have a team of volunteers that um, do this under the microscope. And mm -hmm. I think it's the most fun project that anyone can work on at the museum because you just, it's discovery, right? You don't know what is living under there until you look at all these little tiny things. And it's pretty cool to look at them under the microscope. Wow. Yeah. No, and I, I can see the excitement behind that. And I, I can visual, I, I can visualize myself wanting to do that now, going to leaf litter and, Come on down. <laughs> and yeah, and just start sifting and seeing what, what, what can, what we can, you know, discover or find underneath what's been living under the leaf litter of, you know, various areas when you go hiking around, you know, different Absolutely. areas of San Diego. <laughs> mm -hmm. So now whenever I walk around in leaf litter, I'm going to think about that. Like I'm going to visualize that aspect of it. Start like brushing it around and yeah. get a little a little loop and start looking at what's under there. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you talked about our volunteers and I know our volunteers are really important uh, to the work that we do. And a lot of times when we speak of volunteers, it's also, uh, there's mentors that, that, that uh, the, the concept and the, and the story of mentorship is also a big one and an important role. A lot of times for, for, for our research and in other fields as well, is you mentioned Bob Anderson as someone that that that, um, that you started working with. What roles did mentors play for you um, to kind of, you know, developing your passion or, or understanding what it is that you want to do and, you know, putting so much energy in, con in conservation and in research? Is there, you know, is there, are there other mentors that, that come to mind? Uh, sure. Anyone I've worked with, basically, um, I feel like it's super important. And to that, that um, you know, passion is contagious, sort of. And uh, Bob was the first person that opened my eyes to this. So he has a special place in my heart, for sure. And uh, it's also, he's super goofy. He's, you know, we got along very, very well. So it was just a good team. But I think... Um, you know, the role of mentors in, in, in shaping people's lives is like huge, just like teachers, you know, you always have that favorite teacher from your school days. And it's uh, pretty, pretty astounding how, how much of an effect they have on your life and where it, the turns take you. So I never imagined, you know, that I'd be in entomology. Yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty crazy that his influence was was the driving factor, I feel. And um, his passion for discovery is just contagious. And so I feel like I've taken that and we still talk all the time. So it's nice. That's wonderful. That's great. I know it's always something that, that, that um, it's good to kind of think back about it and then just see the, the influence that people have had in, on our careers. And it's something that when we ever have our member meetups or, or the people that are coming in and, and meeting with us, they like to share those stories as well. So thank you for that. And there was one question that came up about reclassifying or if, if a species were to get reclassified and how that might affect organization of the collection. Is there kind of like what, what goes on when something gets reclassified? Does it like really throw a wrench for the collection uh, on your side of things? It can. It can. I just did this yesterday, actually. A researcher got in touch with me and said, um, I checked your data online and this species is actually not this species anymore. It's this one. So I then have to update the online records with the new species determination and then come into the collection and take those specimens and shift them to the other, the new classification, the new species identification. So I did that just yesterday. Um, it, there's two ways to organize your collection. So um, I started out doing it taxonomically. So, um, you know, beetles would be, um, and whatever is more closely related is closer together in the collection, but the, the, the classification is changing very often. So it leads to a lot of work of updating that and shifting things around. So We've taken a different approach here. And I think more and more collections do this now is that this higher taxonomy, so like beetles and then scarabs are separated from weevils, they're different. Um, but then within that, things are alphabetical. So 
you're not spending all that time shifting things around all the time. And then it's actually at the species level that you're doing most of the shifts. So it's a little bit less work, <laughs> but you can still find everything. So it works and that's great. That's awesome. Well, Pam, um, if you can believe it, our time is out. Yeah, like <laughs> the third, yeah. Our, it, it always it always goes by so fast. Uh, but look, I definitely want to take this time to thank you for joining us and sharing some great stories of of your role and the projects that that you have going on right now. We're gonna welcome Emily back. To, she has a bunch of great things to share about upcoming events for our members. Uh, so with that, Emily, we'll turn it over to you. Pam, again, thank you so thank much you. for being here with us today. We really thank appreciate you. you. Take care.